This story happened when my girlfriend Lindsay resided in Tokyo, Japan for her teaching abroad occupation. She taught English to foreigners for a fairly decent pay. I personally wasn't too cultivated by the idea as the thought of Lindsay being in a foreign country by herself really stressed me out. I can't wait for you to fly over. Yeah, me too, babe. Hey, can you please make sure your doors are locked? I already locked it, silly. Stop being so paranoid. I know I'm being paranoid. I just... I just want you to be safe, okay? Don't worry, I am. Being away from Lindsay definitely took a toll on my health, as I would constantly get anxious from worrying about her safety. Knowing that I didn't have the capability of protecting her from any unlawful perpetrators always gave me extreme anxiety. Which is why my doctor prescribed an inhaler for me to use every time I felt the symptoms get out of hand. I didn't do too well with long distance relationships, but I really wanted to support Lindsay in her career endeavors. I'd fly over there on occasion, usually around the holidays when work wasn't so strenuous for the both of us. I remember spending the majority of my time watching the rather odd Japanese game shows while Lindsay and her roommate Saki would do after hours work from home. Staying in Japan was quite the culture shock. I wasn't used to the Eastern lifestyle, but the longer I stayed there, the more accustomed I became. Or I should say, the more comfortable I felt with Lindsay's stay there. Being halfway across the world made me adjust my sleeping schedule as I made it my duty to video chat Lindsay every day at exactly 3 a.m. in the morning. 3 a.m. over here was equivalent to 5 p.m. over there according to the time zone difference. I'd make it a routine to catch Lindsay after her work shift was done, even if that cost me a few hours of sleep. You guys doing anything for Halloween? Yup, Saki and I are probably going bar hopping. That sounds nice. I wish I could be there Babe, with- Babe, we'll talk later. Saki's calling me. Seeing that Lindsay had a roommate to acquaint herself with gave me a little peace of mind. A lot of my friends were well aware of how concerned I was about Lindsay's well-being, so much so that they would message me encouraging words to help cheer me up. But all of that changed one night, when I got a message from one of my close colleagues from school. I opened the message and read, Hey Craig, I know you're concerned about Lindsay, so I thought you might want to check this link out. It was a link to a forum titled, Is Teaching Abroad in Japan Safe? I hesitantly clicked the link, only to see the forum containing a large thread of positive comments saying stuff like, Teaching there was a great experience, highly recommended or once you go Japan, you'll never need another plan, stuff like that. I then came across a user that posted a comment saying, for those who are considering being a tutor in Japan, you might wanna watch this first before you fully commit, with a link right next to it. I felt extremely skeptical clicking the link, but my curiosity was too overbearing to withstand my compulsion, so I clicked it. I then saw a low-grade video of a woman with her hands bound to the ceiling while being completely wrapped in duct tape. The woman was also wearing a plain white mask over her face with the word dog written on it. I couldn't tell if this was a joke or some sort of sick snuff film until I saw a man approaching the woman holding a large machete. I could hear this poor lady screaming in agony as he began to shout, What is your name? Please sir, please just let me go. What is your name? My name is Kathy. Please don't hurt Wrong me. answer! Your name is Dog! Ah! Yeah. That's when I exited my web browser and instinctively video call Lindsay. It was about a quarter past three, the time I usually video called her. Oh, why now? Come on, answer the video call, damn it! I assumed she was still at work, or possibly out with the roommate, so I waited patiently for a return call at her convenience. I decided to stroll around Instagram for another hour or so till it was time to call it a night. I noticed Lindsay had posted a few pictures from the Halloween night out she had a couple days ago. It looked like a huge costume festival of some sort on the streets of Japan. That's when I spotted a shocking revelation in each of the photos presented. I saw a man wearing the same god mask as in the snuff film I'd seen earlier, nonchalantly masquerading in the background of the photos. He was in every photo looking towards the direction of where the picture was being taken. 
or should I say, the direction of where my girlfriend and her roommate were. That's when I get a video call from Lindsay. I unnervingly accept it and see what seemed to be Lindsay and her roommate Saki wearing white masks with the words Dog 1 and Dog 2 written on them. Hey, why the hell are you guys wearing that? I want to play a game. Guys, who the hell is that? They both stood there silent looking at the webcam, almost like my words didn't have any significant purpose to them. I then heard the man in the background saying, Transfer $20,000 to Dog 2's PayPal account right now, or else they both die. What the hell is going on? Please, leave them alone or I'll call the cops! So be it. Dog 2, take out Dog 1, now! Please don't make me do this! Do it! Dog 2, take out Please Dog 1 now or else you're both getting taken out! Please don't make me do this! Do it, Dog 2! Take out Dog 1 right now! Or else I'm taking you both out! No, please, no, please. That's when Lindsay raises a large kitchen blade in the air and stabs Saki in the neck. I can hear her gargling her own blood while struggling to gasp for what seemed to be her last remaining breaths on Earth. Dude, please stop this! I'm begging you! I'll do anything you want! Just, just please don't hurt my girlfriend! That's when the voice in the background revealed himself only to unveil the same man wearing the god mask that I'd seen in a snuff film and Instagram photos earlier. He then grabbed Lindsay by the forehead and raised a huge machete in the air saying, Transfer the money or else this dog gets put down too! Dude, please, I'm transferring the money right now! That's when I grabbed my phone and immediately began to transfer $20,000 to Lindsay's PayPal account. Here, here, look, I transferred $20,000! Now, now please, can you let her go? I did everything you wanted! The man then approached the camera up close and began saying, I'm just a guy trying to survive in this cold, cold world. I just do what I have to do to put food on my family's table, you know? Just know that God has nothing to do with this. What the hell? I began to request for another video chat, but there was no answer. That's when I get two messages from Lindsay's account. I click the chat box and see an image of Lindsay's severed head on top of the computer desk. The other image was a meme face with the caption, Gotcha. This is one of the most terrifying encounters that I've ever experienced. I still get nightmares just thinking about it. As a matter of fact, the nightmares reoccur so frequently that I see them more often than I see my relatives who live down the street from me. The dreams took place in what looked like a forbidden realm of darkness, almost like I was in an underground world where the sky was red and my surroundings were engulfed in flames. Where the hell am I? Is anyone out there? That's when I see a woman casually approach my direction, except she's spider walking backwards like a scene out of The Exorcist. Her face was distinct. I recognized her in all my other reoccurring nightmares. I need help. Please help me. How can I help you? Help me. What the hell? Just a dream. Just a dream. Everything's gonna be okay. It's been about several months since I had these reoccurring nightmares. I realized there was always one common denominator. That woman. Her distinct facial features and horrendous screams for help was always something I couldn't forget, nor ignore as I knew I would inevitably see her again in my sleep. I coincidentally began experiencing these nightmares when I started working my new job as a cashier clerk at a 7-Eleven gas station. I attributed the nightmares to the lack of sleep I accumulated while working there. I unfortunately worked night shifts at the time as I couldn't really find a job within my field of study. 
As much as I didn't enjoy working the graveyard shift, we usually didn't garner as many customers as the day shift would. Maybe just the occasional night owls or creeps that would stop by. Hey kid, can I have ten bucks? Um, sir, I'm afraid I can't give you that- Kid, I need the money so I can get some of that good good. I'll share some with you, okay? Sir, if you aren't going to buy anything, then I'm gonna have to ask you to leave. <laughs> you smell like the leftover Popeyes that I ate from the dumpster yesterday. Meeting sus customers always left me feeling uneasy for the latter part of my time working there, but for the most part, the shift was pretty chill. I would always procrastinate by watching my favorite YouTube videos to help pass the time. The 7-Eleven was located in a secluded area near a freeway where most travelers going on a road trip would make a pit stop at. So the majority of our customers were either from out of town or just local residents trying to fill up their gas tank. Maybe get a hot cup of coffee on the side. I remember this one particular shift. A vehicle pulled in and parked at one of the gas pumps. I decided to sip on my coffee and hopefully become more attentive for my drowsy state, just in case the customer needed my help. As I was putting my cup of coffee down, <sighs> I noticed the customer was standing right in front of me without a trace of a sound made. $30 regular for pump three, please. I honestly thought I was seeing things as the woman looked so familiar to the point where I completely disregarded her question. I I'm sorry, do I know you from somewhere? that I know of. I, I feel like I know you from somewhere. You look really familiar. Um, sorry. I think you might have the wrong girl, sir. But I think we met each other from somewhere. I just know it. Are you sure we didn't go to school together? No, we didn't. I really have to get to work now. Oh, I I'm sorry, ma'am. It's, it's been a long night. 30 bucks for pump three it is. The woman then slid 30 bucks towards me and began walking towards her vehicle. That's when I put two and two together. I recognized the woman as she looked like a potential culprit for the sadistic nightmares I've been having. As the woman began pumping gas outside, I could see she was making direct eye contact with me. Probably because my brief interrogation made her feel a little uncomfortable. I decided to lock eyes with her as I wanted to observe more of the woman's mannerisms, in hopes that I could potentially pick up any significant ties to her physical appearance in relation to my reoccurring nightmare. Her face, her eyes, that has to be her, I just know it. The woman eventually got inside her vehicle and drove off as I stood there completely flabbergasted till my shift was over. The next evening, I recall getting ready for another shift as I personally liked taking hot showers beforehand. I remember taking the late night bus to work while casually glancing at the window, pondering if I was ever going to encounter that woman again. The ride to work took approximately 30 minutes, so taking a power nap was completely justifiable. I would always find myself seated at the back of the bus as I personally liked napping without having the awkward feeling of being watched. I remember closing my eyes and slowly lulling myself into a deep sleep, hoping to make up for all the tireless mileage of work I had been through during that week. As I began to slowly drift off, I recall opening my eyes and still being inside the bus except everything was in an alternate red world. I can see all the passengers looking at me except they all looked expired, like they'd been rotting on the bus for months. Hey, bus driver, can you stop the bus? This bus doesn't make any stops. This is just a one-way detour, kid. Bus driver, I need to get off now! That's when I saw her again, sitting near the front of the bus, glancing at me while repeating the words, Help me! Help me! Help me! Sir, I'm going to respectfully ask you to exit the bus, please. As I departed the bus, I remember walking an extra 10 minutes to work as the bus driver abruptly dropped me off due to my impromptu disturbance. I eventually made my way inside the 7-Eleven and began my shift, making my usual cup of coffee. That's when I see a familiar vehicle pull into one of the gas pumps and put itself in park. Oh my god, that's gotta be her again. 
The same exact woman that I encountered the last time got out of her vehicle and began entering the gas station. I began to stroll on my cell phone without making it seem like I was intrigued by her appearance while she casually approached the front counter and said, $30 regular for pump three, please. Ma'am, do I know you? No. Didn't you ask me that last time? Yeah, but uh, I'm sorry. It's just, I feel like I've seen you in my dreams before. <sighs> sorry, kid, but I'm unfortunately taken. No, I wasn't trying to get at your... <sighs> my apologies, ma'am. $30 for pump three it is. The woman then leaves the cash on the counter and begins to head outside to pump gas into her vehicle. As I nosily glance at the woman, I see the same homeless creep from the other night approach her. He honestly looked like he was on something from the way his eyes were bloodshot and twitchy. I assumed he was going to harass her for change like how he does with most of the customers that come by during these hours. But what happened next, I never saw coming. The man yanked the gas pump from out of the woman's vehicle and sprayed her with gasoline while she yelled out in agony from the toxic fluid seeping into her skin and eyeballs. I quickly call for law enforcement while running towards the aid of the woman. But I stopped dead in my tracks as the homeless man lit the woman on fire. I need help! I need help! Why are you just standing there? Help me! I hate Christmas. I hate it with the most malice intentions ever. As a matter of fact, the thought of Christmas makes my skin crawl. I wasn't like this before. I used to cherish the holiday tradition, but all of that's changed now. It all started a couple years back when I was 26 years old. It was the holidays, so Christmas was around the corner while festivities were in full effect. Hey, I'm on my way to pick you up. I'm excited to go Christmas shopping! Yeah, me too. Me and my girlfriend Emma had dated since high school, so the bond that we shared was something most couples couldn't fathom to say the least. I decided to propose to Emma on Christmas. Figured I couldn't go wrong on such a monumental occasion. I remember it being a snowy evening when me and Emma went to the mall to do some holiday Christmas shopping. The mall was bombarded with more shoppers than usual as there was a holiday sale going on in almost every store. I remember being in need of a festive outfit for my parents' upcoming Christmas party as my wardrobe lacked the attire. I decided to check out the clothing store Forever 21 as I could see they had a wide variety of selection from first glance. I picked out an array of various Christmas sweaters and headed to the fitting room while my girlfriend waited outside for me. Oh yeah, fits way better than my dad's lame hand-me-downs. Hey babe, how does this look? I noticed my girlfriend Emma wasn't there. I figured she must have gone back into the store to look at more clothes. As I left the changing room, I noticed from the corner of my eye that Emma was outside the store waiting in a huge line for something. I ended up purchasing one of the sweaters and began to approach Emma. Hey babe, why'd you leave me hanging in the fitting room? I wanted to line up and take a picture with him. Emma, this line is huge. I'll just dress up as Santa later and you can take a picture of me. He's not Santa, though. I looked towards the direction of where the lineup began and realized that there were two separate lineups. One lineup was for a professionally taken photo with the mall Santa. The other lineup was for a picture with a man dressed as the Grinch. We were unfortunately in the lineup for the Grinch as Emma was a pretty big fan of the character. I personally found the whole ordeal bizarre considering he didn't have any professional setup like how the mall Santa had. No platform, no chair, no professional photographer, no elf services, just him and the bench he sat on. I assumed he was one of those street performers that just dressed up for donations except there was no tip jar or anything that would allow guests to donate in. Emma, this guy looks kinda sus, can we just leave? Please just relax, Henry. It'll only take a couple of minutes. I decided to bite my tongue and proceed with Emma's request as there was nothing I could have said that could convince her otherwise. As we got closer to the front of the lineup, I could visibly see the Grinch's eyes light up with exhilaration, almost like I brought a sense of enthusiasm into his day. 
I decided to be ballsy and lock eyes with him, just to express more of my alpha male side towards this weirdo. As the line gradually progressed, I realized that he wasn't making eye contact with me, he was looking at my girlfriend Emma. It was blatantly obvious he had an interest in my girlfriend due to the lack of attention he was giving others taking photos with him. What the hell is this guy's problem? Why is he checking out my girlfriend? We eventually reached the front of the line and approached the Grinch to take a three-way selfie with my cell phone. Hey buddy, the girl gets a picture first. Dude, that's my girlfriend. I said, get behind the girl, kid. Uh, stupid green prick. Another beautiful ho. What did you just call me? I mean, ho ho ho, Merry Christmas. What's your name, little girl? Um... My name is Emma. Ooh, what a beautiful name to match such a beautiful face. Why don't you come here and sit on Daddy's lap? Dude, what the hell is your problem? Back off, loser. She wants a picture with me, not you. He's my boyfriend. Don't talk to him like that. Sit on my lap and be a good girl, Emma. Or else Santa won't give you any presents this year. <laughs> I'm putting you on my naughty list, you little brat! That's when we decided to head home. I remember dropping off my girlfriend at her place and then heading home to assist my parents in prepping for the Christmas party the following night. My parents were really old school and put a lot of effort into decorating their household, especially during festive holidays like this. Later that night, I remember making myself a glass of hot chocolate spiked with a little bit of my dad's whiskey. I sat by the fireplace and enjoyed the fire-crackling ambience while casually sipping on my drink. Figured I couldn't go wrong with that on a warm Christmas Eve. I remember hearing my cell phone ringing throughout the night. I recall being so intoxicated I couldn't see nor hear anything distinctively. Everything was blurry. It felt virtually impossible to move any fiber of my body, almost like I was stuck in a subconscious state of sleep paralysis. I began to close my eyes and doze off again. A couple hours later, I recall a voice whispering my name. Hey, Henry. Henry, Henry wake, wake up. up. Hello, wake, wake up, up, little drunk, drunk. It's, it's me, Santa. I could vaguely see the outline of a man that looked like a Santa figure standing in front of me. Bear in mind, I was still in a groggy and incoherent state of mind, so making out the gentleman's minuscule facial features was almost an impossible endeavor to comprehend. Hey, Henry, I brought you a Christmas present. Dad, is that you? Henry, listen. I want, I want you to open up this Christmas gift first when you wake up. Do you understand me? Uh, uh, sir. I'm going to leave it right here in the middle of the Christmas tree, okay? Okay. Anyways, Merry Christmas, Henry. Merry Christmas, Dad. Shh, time to go to sleep again, Henry. A couple hours later... I get awoken by the light from the living room window illuminating on my face. I realized I had blacked out due to the spike concoction I had whipped up the previous night. I check my cell phone and realize that I had about 10 missed calls and over 100 missed texts from Emma. I open the text messages, only to see the text reading, Hey, is that you? Are you inside my place? This isn't funny, Henry. And so on and so forth. What I found more disturbing was the last batch of messages which read, I knew you were going to propose all along. Merry Christmas, Henry. It just kept repeating over and over again. I began calling Emma's cell phone and only got her voicemail. That's when I closed my eyes and began recollecting the imagery of what transpired last night. I could vaguely recall someone dressed as Santa and leaving a present underneath the Christmas tree. That's when I notice a box that looked out of place from the rest of the presents. I took the box and opened it, only to discover a severed hand. The hand had a message on it which read, Marry me.
This is one of the most disturbing things that I have ever encountered growing up. It happened a while ago when I was in my early teens. I had a cousin named Larry who was extremely socially awkward and didn't have much friends at school. My parents would force me to interact with him due to his lack of friends and inability to create social interaction. This was quite understandable, as Larry's mother died from a freak accident at work a couple years back. She was allegedly killed in an incident where a forklift driver was backing up and had completely crushed her without hearing or seeing anything due to the loud music he was blasting through his earphones. I wasn't exactly close with Larry, but considering we were both an only child, I'd figure hanging out with him more often couldn't hurt, as I knew he needed a companion who could possibly get him one step to getting some closure. It was usually every Saturday that my parents would drop me off at his place. I would notice that Larry always had this look of fear and distress, due to the mannerisms and body language he gave off every time I visited him. What made things even worse was the fact that his mom passed away just one day before his birthday, so seeing him like this was completely justifiable. Dude, you okay? He just stood there, quiet, almost like the soul in his body was non-existent. Don't worry, Larry. I'm sure your mom is proud of everything you will accomplish in life, okay? You'll have lots to tell her in the afterlife. Larry then nodded his head and proceeded to the living room to watch some television. I couldn't help but feel sad and remorseful about the whole ordeal, as I knew losing his mom must have given him severe depression, due to how close they were growing up. I remember this one Saturday evening. My parents dropped me off at Larry's house to go attend a dinner that some older relatives were hosting that night. Usually, all the adults went, including Larry's dad, who was my uncle. I honestly felt an immense amount of remorse when I saw him as well, due to the look of anguish and misery on his face. I also noticed he had these visible dark circles around his eyes as if he hadn't slept in days, or even months for that matter. Hey boys, whatever you do, just stay up here and play video games. Food should be on the kitchen counter. Sounds good, uncle. And whatever you do, do not go into the basement. Uh, why? I said do not go into the basement, damn it. There's a monster down there that will kill you both. You hear me? Yes, sir. I'll see you boys in a couple of hours. That's when Larry's dad headed out the front door, leaving me and Larry in the house all by ourselves. Not too long after his departure, I couldn't help but think of what Larry's dad was referring to when he said the monster. Was he hiding something down there that he didn't want us to know? Was he saying that just to scare the living crap out of us? Whatever his intentions were, he definitely left me creeped out, but at the same time curious as to what this so-called monster was. Hey, Larry, have you ever seen this monster? Larry shifted his eyes towards me and then back towards the television as if he wanted to awkwardly brush off the topic at hand. Dude, is there actually a monster in your basement? I need to know. I don't feel comfortable talking about this. So you do have a monster in your basement, eh? Have you seen it? No, but I heard it before. Are you freaking kidding me? Dude, we have to check it out! I don't think that's a good idea- Let's go before your dad comes back from dinner. I promise, it'll only be two minutes tops. We'll, we'll act like nothing happened. <sighs> Fine. Uh, let's make it quick. But we have to use a flashlight, because the light switch doesn't work. That's when Larry and I began to approach the basement, as I felt an adrenaline rush flowing through my body. I can't believe this is actually happening. Am I really about to see a real-life monster? As we made it down the steps, the first thing I noticed right off the bat was how dark everything was. I noticed Larry's dad had patched up the windows with cardboard and duct tape, which I found quite bizarre considering the light switch wasn't functional. I was left dumbfounded as to why he would want complete darkness down here. All I could see was dozens of stacked boxes and miscellaneous items scattered everywhere. As we got a little further into the basement, Larry pointed the flashlight at a door that looked like an entrance to a miniature den room. We both noticed that the doorknob had no lock on it, nor was there any padlock preventing us from opening the door. That's where I heard the monster last time. What the hell is that? It's the m m monster 
That's when I cautiously approached the door, as Larry followed behind me while holding the flashlight towards my direction. I could honestly feel my heart throbbing so hard to the point where I felt like I was legitimately about to have a heart attack. I then grabbed the doorknob and opened the door in one quick motion, only to see a man stripped down to his boxers, drenched in blood. The man had his hands bound to the wall with steel chains and had large gashes all over his body, almost like he had been tortured and cut countless times. He looked extremely distraught and malnourished, almost like he had been held captive for months. Who are you, sir? sir? Free me! Free me! Free me before the devil comes back! I could vaguely make out what he was saying, as the man's teeth had decayed and deteriorated from the gums on his mouth. Me and Larry both stood there, our jaws dropped in awe and disbelief. What the hell are you two doing down here? Nah! Ah! He's the devil! He's the devil! Free me! Ah! I'm sorry, Dad. We didn't mean to disobey- Close the door right now and get the hell upstairs before I beat the crap out of you two! That's when me and Larry quickly made our way upstairs and into the living room. We sat on the couch and continued watching television while Larry's dad approached us and said, I don't want none of you little brats to say a damn thing to anyone about that monster downstairs. You got it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Definitely. Any of you say anything and I swear to God I will lock you in that room with that monster. It's been a couple of years since that bizarre incident had occurred. I now have a family, and I'm a full-time insurance broker. I haven't communicated or visited Larry since, and quite frankly, I don't think I ever will. I haven't told my parents about the situation due to the fear that Larry's dad instilled in me. As a matter of fact, I don't even think they talk to him either, as Larry's dad has completely shunned our entire family and relatives away. I speculate that the man I saw that night had something to do with the death of Larry's mom. As I write this to share with the internet, I still ponder if that man is still locked in Larry's basement after all these years. Or should I say, the monster. The story happened about a decade ago when I was in my mid-twenties. I lived alone in a quiet residential area, just outside the city of where the club district was. Moving out of my parents' house and becoming independent forced me to live a more mature lifestyle, as adulthood settled in at a fairly young age. Considering this story occurred in the mid-2000s, finding a companion was a lot more difficult than today's modern day, as the lack of apps such as Tinder was non-existent at the time. I felt like I had completely lost my social skills due to my odd obsession with gore videos. I had been completely hooked with such content since my high school days, as the exhilarating thrill always satisfied my adrenaline junkie cravings. No matter how many females I would approach throughout the months, it would always seem like they had a radar for my nervous demeanor and odd interests. I remember one Friday shift. One of my co-workers recommended that I check out this local gentleman's club that hosted fairly decent looking girls. Bro, I, I don't want to go somewhere that's rated two stars. Well, if you ever want your engine running again, then you better take it for a test drive. Uh, in English please? <sighs> Dude, if you ever want to gain your confidence back, then it's best that you go out and meet hot chicks there. I guess, but I don't- Dude. Don't worry, you'll get your money's worth. A couple hours later, the evening had finally settled in, and it was time to hit up that gentleman's club that my co-worker insisted I check out. I remember wisely taking a cab, just because I knew the state I was going to be in from all the drinks I planned on hammering down there. As I settled into the premises, I remember chugging at least several beers while casually surveying my surroundings, or should I say, the array of beautiful women around me. So mesmerizing. Uh, okay, must not simp. 
I can recall spending the remainder of the wad of cash I brought with me on the various dancers that caught my eye. Let's just say I got my money's worth, just as my co-worker had predicted. I eventually headed out and remembered trying to flag down a nearby taxi when I noticed an attractive female sitting curbside by herself. I noticed she had a leg brace on with crutches right next to her, which gave me the idea to pursue a conversation and possibly pick her up. I guess having an injured leg doesn't stop you from partying, does it? Not at all. Especially when I get to spontaneously meet guys like you. Oh, <laughs> what's your name? You can call me Bunny. That's what my friends call me. Okay, Bunny. Do you wanna... Your name, please? You can call me Zaddy. I, I mean, Bob. Okay, Bob. Are you looking for a good time? Hell yeah, girl. <laughs> well, you should come over to my place then. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm gonna show you why my ex used to call me the, <clears throat> the, the Punisher. That's when I blink, only to find myself taking a cab on the way to the bunny's house. The car ride was quite the faint memory, as my vision wasn't so vivid from the amount of drinks I had consumed at the bar. I could recall getting out of the cab and observing the rather odd appearance of the bunny's home. I noticed right off the bat that the house was in a secluded area where the forest preserve was. I found it quite sketchy that the windows were boarded up, almost like it was an abandoned house in the middle of nowhere. As we made our way inside, I could recall the house having an unpleasant stench, almost like the house hadn't been cleaned in weeks, or months for that matter. I remember finding myself laying on the bed of what I assumed was the bunny's bedroom. Compared to the rest of the house, the bedroom looked pretty well kept, so if anything was to go down between us, it would make me feel more comfortable, to say the least. That's when I noticed the bunny holding a large Bugs Bunny mask while looking at me with an unpropitious smile, almost like she was intentionally trying to creep me out. Meet Bunny! Wait, what? I said... Meet Bunny. What in the hell are you talking about? Nyeh. What's up, Doc? <laughs> you're, you're starting to creep me out. Don't be scared, Bob. It's just a mask. Uh, okay. Here. Why don't you take a nap and wake up in an hour? Okay? I remember closing my eyes and slowly beginning to fade into the realm of darkness, as my intoxicated state had completely shunned my vision. This is when the story gets a little more disturbing. I miraculously awaken from my so-called power nap, only to hear the bunny humming an unsettling melody in the washroom. I also noticed a blinking red dot on the ceiling in front of me. As my eyes slowly began to adjust, I realized that it was a camcorder secretly recording me while I was passed out the entire time. I also noticed the bunny's crutches were on the floor, right next to the entrance of the washroom. I found it was quite strange that she had completely abandoned the crutches due to the fact that it was used to aid her walking the entire time. As I approached the washroom, I could see the bunny effortlessly standing in front of the mirror without the leg brace, wearing the same Bugs Bunny mask she had showcased earlier. She also held a huge sledgehammer close to her face while creepily gazing into the mirror as if she was admiring her attire. I cautiously made my way outside of the bedroom while making sure I grabbed the camcorder that was just recording me. As I made my way out the front door, I couldn't bother with my shoes, as I felt every second was crucial for my survival. I eventually caught a cab and successfully made it home, miraculously alive and unscathed. I decided to open the camcorder and play back the most recent footage recorded. I could see myself laying on the bed passed out drunk, while the bunny was most likely in the washroom. As I explored more of the footage on the camcorder, I began to notice a similar pattern with several other males being secretly recorded in their sleep. 
what makes the story more disturbing was the bullet I dodged by leaving the house. I remember seeing the bunny approach each male in a similar fashion, while holding the same sledgehammer and wearing the same Bugs Bunny mask I had seen her wear in our encounter. What she did next to these men was something that made me no longer interested in gore videos, as I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. This is a story that happened a few years back when I was in my early 20s. It was a Friday morning when I was getting ready to meet up with my friends from college to head to Coachella. My friends were always excited every time we brought up Coachella as they were extreme EDM freaks that loved to rave and party like the majority of students on campus. I personally didn't like EDM and was more of a rap kind of guy, but I always attended the events as Coachella usually hosted special guests to do special appearances, so that made the idea of going much more appealing to me. Another reason I enjoyed going was the guaranteed barrage of beautiful females that would usually show up to these types of events. I remember my friends meeting up at my place to do our usual pre-drinking routine, which was something we always did prior to any event similar to this. I recall taking multiple shots with my female friends Jody and Mika, while my friend Nick watched us as he was unfortunately the designated driver. Cheers to getting wasted and not kissing someone that's related. Cheers! Cheers. Uh, I guess I'll cheer with this. That's when we got inside Nick's vehicle and began to drift off onto the freeway, finally making our way to the much anticipated event we've been geeking about for months on end. The ride usually took us about an hour and a half to get there, but seeing as Coachella was a large event, it prolonged the trip by another hour or so due to the traffic from the Coachella attendees. When we finally reached the destination, Nick parked his car in the pre-designated lot as we began to make our way inside the Coachella premises. The view was extraordinary. I always got a huge boost of serotonin from the incredible visuals being displayed. I legitimately felt like every time I attended music festivals of this magnitude, it was always equivalent to being a kid in a candy shop. The majority of people I saw were of course the usual hipsters and jocks who would always have that one person in the group annoyingly vlogging every minuscule second of their experience. Then of course there were the extreme EDM ravers who always went over the top with their flamboyant outfits. But. Then there was that one occasional overaged creep who always looked out of place in events like this, considering the majority of guests were usually in their 20s and early 30s. I recall this one guy looking like he was in his late 40s, possibly 50s from the beer gut hanging down from his trousers and the rough aged look he had on his face. I usually couldn't care less who attended these events, but this guy gave me straight up predator vibes from the way he was lurking around the women. That's when the man eventually catches me looking at him. I nonchalantly look away as I can see the man in my peripheral vision approaching our group. We all awkwardly stare at him as he begins to catcall my friend Jody by saying, Hey sweetie, you want me to rock your world by adding a little something something to your drink? Um, like what? That's when he begins to gargle up a load of saliva in his mouth and spits out a large slimy glob directly inside Jody's <sighs> cup. She drops it almost instantaneously in disgust. What the hell, dude? Yo, what the hell is your problem? Hey, I wasn't trying to rock your world, dimwit. I was talking to Miss Melons over here. Get the hell away from us or I'm calling the cops. Next time, say it a little louder so that the cops can actually hear you. He walks away as we begin to head over to another vendor opposite to where the man was walking to grab more drinks. As the night went on, I was so plastered all I saw was nothing but hallucinative imagery while fanboying over the performances that were currently on stage. This happened for about two nights straight, as me and my friends would get completely wasted and pull all-nighters throughout our whole experience at Coachella. On the last night, I remember my friend Jody was sitting on my shoulders, which was a common thing for females to do during festivals like this. I recall a man in the midst of the crowd staring at my direction. I honestly couldn't tell if I was hallucinating or not, but 
All I can remember was that the man was standing in the opposite direction away from the stage as opposed to facing it. At first glance, I couldn't make out who it was, but then I realized that it was the same guy from before. This obviously had a million red flags written all over it, as no person in their right state of mind would look at the audience's direction throughout the entire duration of a live performance. What the hell? Ah! What's wrong? I, I just... I just need to use the restroom. Mark, is everything okay? Do you need me to walk you there? No, 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 no. I'm fine, Jody. Just... just wait here, okay? That's when I began to run towards the porta potties as I desperately needed to vomit. Jesus Christ. I recall sitting on the toilet seat trying to regain some of my consciousness back in hopes that I could sober up and join my friends at the concert again. That's when my entire world began to shake. No, I mean literally, my entire world began to shake as the porta potty began violently shifting back and forth. What the hell is going on? Somebody help me! Help! I was so intoxicated, I genuinely thought I was experiencing an earthquake. The porta potty then abruptly stopped shaking as I hear a shallow voice whispering, I decided to rock your world too. That's when I immediately got out of the porta potty and surveyed the circumference of my surroundings, only to see no sight of the man. Are you okay, sir? I heard you screaming. Ah! I began to sprint towards the sleeping area where designated tents were as I really needed to get some rest. I then got inside my tent and curled up in my sleeping bag in hopes that I would sleep off my intoxicated state. I made sure to update my friends by sending a quick text in the group chat just so they knew my whereabouts as I began to drift off. About five minutes later, I recall my friend Jody approaching the outside of my tent saying, Hey babe, is everything okay? I told her, yeah, I think I am. I want to give you a kiss. Uh, okay. Here, pass me your phone. I want to remember this moment forever. Stop! Stop! Kiss me! Kiss me! Kiss Come on, me! Mark. Come on, kiss Mark. me! Come on! Kiss me! Come on! Come kiss on. me! Kiss me! Kiss me! Stop! Stop! Kiss me. Stop! That's when I opened my eyes, only to be awoken by my friends. The festival had unfortunately came to an end, and it was time to make our departure home. I remember sobering up on the ride home while praising my friend Jody by saying, Hey, Jody, I just want to thank you for consoling me in the tent. It means a lot. Um, any time, but when did I console you? Jody, you kissed me in the tent, remember? Ooh, didn't know you guys were a thing. Uh, Mark, I don't know what you're talking about. That's when I pulled out my phone as I remember Jody taking a selfie of us kissing. But what I saw on my phone literally made me sick to my stomach. There were about a dozen selfies of me and that man laying next to me in the tent while I was passed out drunk. This is a story that happened a couple months ago when I was in my first year of college. I was a student majoring in industrial engineering but unfortunately started taking online classes due to the global pandemic. Most lectures began surfacing online as my respective professors would host Zoom calls for each course following the other. I wasn't really the biggest fan of taking online classes as I just recently enrolled in the curriculum, so not being able to socially interact with others in the classroom was a bitter pill to swallow, which led me to the idea of using the video chat site Omegle. I remember hearing rumors about it growing up where people would sometimes meet interesting individuals there, maybe some hot chicks if you got lucky enough. The 
thought I'd give it a try one Friday evening. I figured I couldn't go wrong with meeting some random people from across the world while I casually sip on my alcoholic beverage. Come on, where are the girls at? I want to see some- Hey there, what's your name, kid? Uh, I'm Tommy. What's yours? You can call me Creep. Nope. Hey, do you like long walks to the fridge? Uh, not with you. That's when I came across a man with his face painted as a clown replicating Joaquin Phoenix from the Joker movie that premiered a couple months earlier. Hey dude, big fan of the Joker, aren't you? He just sat there in silence while looking directly at the webcam with his gaunt eyes and formidable smile, almost like he was intrigued by my company. Uh, hello, do you talk? Again, he just sat there not saying anything. I was convinced his mic was turned off as I couldn't hear any background ambient noise that I would usually hear when a stranger appears on the screen. I decided to type, I don't think your mic is on dude. That's when he began typing in the chat box himself saying, all I have are negative thoughts looming inside my head. I playfully respond with, why so serious, laugh out loud? Pick a card any card by saying the word stop. He then raises a deck of cards towards the screen and began springing the cards from one hand to the other while I shout stop midway through the deck. The Joker then raises my selected card the seven of diamonds towards the screen. He then inserts the card back inside the deck all while having his head turned in a different direction. Okay Mr. Joker gonna guess my card now? He then typed if you want me to unmute my mic and reveal your card, you have to beat me in a blinking contest. I typed, okay, sure, I guess. The Joker then turns on his mic as I hear the sudden ambient noise come out of nowhere. He then puts his face closer to the webcam with his eyes closed and begins gesturing the numbers one, two, and opening his eyes on the count of three. I began to reciprocate by gluing my eyes to the screen in hopes that any lag from the video chat would mask any blink I would inevitably make. That's when the Joker began to disturbingly grin at the camera with an over-exaggerated smile, almost like he had a weird ability to abnormally stretch his face. I begin to awkwardly smile back as my silly way of expressing a friendly gesture. I could then see tears falling from his eyes, like he was extremely reluctant to close them, almost as if the shame of losing an eye contest meant the world to him. Ah! Ah! What the hell, dude? <laughs> I shouted, Dude, you cheated! as the Joker then began to start blindfolding himself while I awkwardly observe his bizarre antics. He then adjusts the webcam while placing one of his palms face down on the computer table, then begins to raise a large kitchen blade in the air with the other hand. Dude, what the hell are you doing? He then starts stabbing in between the gaps of his fingers. Dude, stop it, are you insane? That's when the Joker began to nonchalantly increase the speed of the stabbing motion while jabbing at the table flawlessly without any trace of a deadly mishap. It was terrifying, but at the same time exhilarating as the Joker did this blindfolded at such a rapid speed that to the video chat it legitimately looked like a camera trick. I shouted, Dude, how the hell did you do that? As the Joker simultaneously zoomed his webcam closer to the table. He then begins to type, I want to see that again, but this time in IMAX? I typed, sure, I guess. He then responds with, Let me mute my mic. That way you don't hear my screams of agony in the unfortunate event that I make a mistake. I was a little alarmed with the sudden disclaimer, but oddly enough decided to observe the rest of his stunt. I watched him place his trembling hand on the table. What he did next was 
one of the most disturbing things I've ever seen in my life. He began carving the tip of the blade into the surface of his palm. I screamed. Dude, no, 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 stop it! What the hell is wrong with you? Dude, stop, stop! What the hell is wrong with you? As his bloody hand began to tremble uncontrollably with blood spewing everywhere. Stop it! Please, stop! <laughs> That's when the Joker unmutes his mic, unveiling the sounds of a muffled whimper, like his mouth had been covered with something. What I saw next single-handedly made me not want to ever go back on Omega again. The Joker raises his webcam, revealing the source of the actual hand he was hacking at. It was a man that looked to be in his mid-twenties with duct tape on his mouth, shivering from the lethal torture the Joker put him through. Look, it wasn't even my hand! <laughs> Leave him alone or I'm calling the cops! As I look closer at the screen, I notice he had carved the value and suit of the playing card I had selected in the beginning of the video chat. And seven of diamonds. We'll kick things off with a real heavy one. Prepare yourselves. Three years ago, a man who went by the username Jason in Hell made a post on the r slash relationship advice subreddit. The title of his post spoke for itself. I'm having a hard time coping with my wife having cheated on me with our neighbor. The post itself was a long read, but I'll give you a quick summary here. Essentially, Jason began by saying that one year prior to posting, he caught his 29-year-old wife having an affair with their 51-year-old neighbor. He decided to stay with her for the sake of their two children, but said that he hadn't been able to get over the betrayal, and that it constantly occupied his mind. It's been 476 days since I confronted her about it. How do I know? Because every time I catch myself thinking about it, I tell myself, it's only been X days, maybe you won't think about it tomorrow. He went on to describe how he found out she was cheating, how he confronted her and the neighbor, and how she responded by threatening him with, you'll never see your kids again if you break up with me. Jason had tried to end his life when he was in high school, so she was going to use that as evidence as to why he was an unfit father, and why he shouldn't have custody or rights to see his children. As such, Jason gave in to her demands and decided to stay with her. She even made the poor guy apologize to the neighbor, after making his post, Jason received various responses, some of them a little tone-deaf, though ultimately, most people agreed he needed to file for divorce pronto. Staying in an unhealthy relationship was a bad idea for both him and the kids. Jason then made a follow-up post, in which he thanked everyone for their advice, and said he was indeed going ahead with the divorce like they suggested, and was meeting with an attorney the following week. Problem solved, right? Far from it. This is where things took a horrible and unforeseeable turn. Jason's wife's name was Brandy Worley. On the evening that Jason filed for divorce, she went to the kitchen, picked up a blade, and took the lives of both of their children by plunging it into their necks. She even tried to end her own life before calling the authorities and telling them what had just happened. All the while, Jason was asleep in the basement. Brandy was sentenced to 120 years in prison. Reddit was in disbelief, especially the relationship advice subreddit. Everyone who read the previous posts knew that Brandy was a horrible person, but I doubt anyone anticipated she was truly evil. Many users felt guilty for the advice they had given Jason, specifically those who had replied with a harsh tone, criticizing him. A mod authored post was made, asking everyone to remember that behind each of the posts on the site was a real person with real problems, and to respond respectfully. In an anonymous environment, people can be quite mean, that's for sure. Jason went on to make one more post, this time titled, Thank You. I would like to give a heartfelt and sincere thank you for the advice and support I have received here. No one could have foreseen the tragedy that resulted from my filing for divorce. You guys perform a wonderful service to those in need, 
and I hope you continue to do so in the future. With the support of YouTuber Philip DeFranco, who raised awareness about the incident, $56,000 was raised to help Jason with living and funeral expenses. I'm sure I speak for all of us when I say our thoughts go out to him. No one deserves to go through what he did. I love my life. I love it because I have no responsibilities anymore. I used to work at my local bakery, but I got fired for eating too much of the cake. I'm just stuck in my room 24 hours a day, playing among us with random strangers online. I personally enjoy it more when I'm the imposter, just because I find it more fun when I'm the killer. 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 Hey, Mom! Mom! Could you fix me a plate of some leftover meatloaf? Mom! I want some leftover meatloaf! Louis, shut up and get it yourself, you lazy lard! Michael, you shut up! Mom! Meatloaf! Get your own freaking meatloaf, sus boy! Or tell one of your stupid Among Us crewmates to make it a task since you're so damn lazy, triple chin! Only thing sus in this house are the sounds I hear coming from your bedroom at 3 a.m. in the morning, loser! I dare you to say that to my face! Get the hell out of my room, Michael! Say it to my face, Louie! Yeah, that's what I thought, sus boy. Next time, tuck your chin underneath your shirt. It'll make it easier to see the screen. Don't kill me! Ah! Help! Somebody go for a meeting! <sighs> well, it looks like my work here is done. Hey, Louie! What? Who's there? It's me, Louie. Michael? <laughs> Turn around, loser! Oh, hey, M Michael. We finally killed them all. Louie, you know there can only be one imposter, right? Uh, what are you talking about? There can only be one of us, Louie. Just like how every story has to have one protagonist and one antagonist. Uh, are you saying we have to kill each other? No, 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 no. We're brothers, Louie. We don't do that to each other. I just mean, only one of us can kill going forward. You know what I mean? Uh, okay. Here, give me your hand. Huh? Don't worry, you can trust me. We're both imposters, remember? Now, just relax your muscles and let the knife do the work. Uh, uh, what the hell are you doing, Michael? Just relax, Louie. Big bro knows what he's doing. Okay. Ah, stop it! Just a little bit more, Louie. Don't worry, you got this, buddy. Ah, you're hurting me, dude! Please, stop it! Don't worry, little bro. It'll be over soon. Just relax, you little wimp! This has to be a dream, but it feels so real. Stop it! Stop it, Louie! What the hell are you doing? Have you lost your damn mind? This story occurred around the early 2000s, back when I was still in elementary school. 
I was in my early teens, so the monotonous school life was something I always dreaded. My mom always picked me up from school as her workplace was just down the street, so getting a ride was always less strenuous than walking home. She would usually stop by our local McDonald's just before heading home as she didn't really prepare home cooked meals due to the exhaustion of being a single mother. As much as I adored my mom, the lack of home cooked meals and abundance of McDonald's always kept me out of shape for the latter part of my teen years. The one thing I found genuinely pleasing about that McDonald's was the enormous play place attached to the restaurant itself. My mom usually dropped me off there to play with my neighborhood friends and acquaintances, as long as I got the majority of my schoolwork done. There was this one occasion, though, that really disturbed me to my core, and it seeps into my daily thoughts from time to time. I remember being picked up from school and heading over to that same McDonald's venue to pick up some takeout for that evening. As we got inside, I recall my mom ordering the usual Big Mac combo while I casually glance at the play place through the glass window of where the eating area was. Jimmy, what drink would you like? Jimmy? Son? What drink would you like? I remember zoning out at this particular moment and could recall the echoes of my mom calling out for me. It was almost as if I couldn't move a muscle, like my entire body was in a state of shock traveling through space and time into another dimension. It felt like it was just me in the play place, like I had the entire setup all to myself. Jenny, what drink do you want? Uh, I'll get a Coke, Mom. As my mom headed back to complete the rest of the order, I could recall seeing the reflection of a Ronald McDonald clown standing from a distance behind me almost like he wanted my attention. I casually pretend like I don't see him by keeping my eyes glued to the glass and not bothering to turn around. I know you can see me on the reflection of the glass. That's when I casually turn towards the direction of the clown and say, uh, can I help you, sir? Yes, my dear boy. Do you or your mother want to see what a pyromaniac can do with a little fire? We're just here to pick up a Big Mac, so no thanks. Maybe I can cook you a delicious giant Big Mac with my fire abilities so that you will never need to come to McDonald's again. Hey, leave us alone or I will call the cops. Go ahead and call them. I'll just teach my cellmates how to start a fire and make an explosion oh so beautiful. <laughs> Let's get out of here, Jimmy. That's when we get inside my mom's vehicle and drive away from the McDonald's. Or should I say the clown? About a week after that bizarre encounter, I spent the majority of my time playing Duck Hunt on my Nintendo as my computer lacked the entertainment that today's modern computer has. I eventually went back to that local McDonald's as I surprisingly missed the food, but more importantly, the play place. As the day transitioned into the evening, my mom dropped me off there as the company of the local teens in the neighborhood made her feel a little more comfortable doing so. I'll be back at 10 p.m. sharp. Call me if you want me to pick you up earlier, okay? Okay, Mom. I decided to call my neighbor friend Chris using the payphone located outside the McDonald's venue. Uh, hello? Hey, Chris, it's Jimmy. You still coming to McDonald's tonight? Oh, hell yeah. I'll be there in one... Hey there! Long time no see! What the hell do you want? Let me show you how I make my fire! <laughs> Get the hell away from me or I'll call the cops! Fine, have it your way then. Your little behind couldn't handle all this smoke anyway. That's when I ran inside the McDonald's and immediately made my way inside the play place. I honestly could have notified a McDonald's employee, or any stranger for that matter, but I ultimately decided to take the high road and wait it out until it was time for my mom to pick me up. I remember making my way up through the tunnels of the playground as I just wanted to reach the very top and avoid any further encounters with any other weirdos. I eventually reached the top of the platform and remember basking in the view as the array of colors from the ball pit was always something I found oddly satisfying to look at. That's when I noticed a familiar head beginning to protrude from the balls in the pit. It was the clown. The same clown from earlier looking up at me with his ominous smile and revolting eyes. What the hell is going on? Why isn't anyone acknowledging this freak? The clown just stood there looking at me as if nothing mattered besides myself and his existence. I know you can hear me up there. 
What the hell do you want? I killed your mother, Jimmy. Now it's only you and your stupid neighbors left. What the hell are you talking about? Jump! Hell no, leave me alone! Oh, don't worry, it's totally safe, Jimmy. Now jump. No, I'm not doing it. Jump! 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 That's when I look to my left and see my friend Chris right next to me. We have no choice. <gasps> what the hell? <laughs> now it's your turn, you little brat! Jump! 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 I began to close my eyes and hyperventilate as I felt a sudden surge of adrenaline flowing through my body. But then I began to feel a rather odd sensation, something like a fiery substance burning the hairs on the back of my neck off. That's when I open my eyes and find myself on my apartment balcony with my entire building engulfed in flames. What the hell? Somebody help me! Help! I hope you all burn in hell and are uh, loving it. I hate you, Dad! You will always and will forever be a clown! I hate you, you stupid, stupid clown! Help! Somebody please call 911! Help! Help me! Somebody please call 911! Help! <laughs> <laughs> Ha 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 